so you can sort of start. With thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the introduction and, and the invitation. And I'm sorry I, I can't be in person. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, if you look at the image here on the cover, this is uh, artificial intelligence, Dali's interpretation of mathematics is everywhere. So um, to generate this image, I had to write a sentence um, that math is everywhere here locally on Wynwood walls. And I added some geometry, which I think gave us the purple patterns and the part of a circle. Um, so for these types of applications, the artificial intelligence learns lots and lots of images and how they're related to sentences and then can generate new images. So my research is at the intersection of neuroscience, the brain, and um, artificial systems and machine learning. So I've been very interested in understanding how the brain makes sense of complex images and how that generates complex perception and behavior. So um, perception and behavior um, can be studied at many different levels from molecules up to synapses and neurons up to whole networks of neurons to perception and behavior. And computation is a critical part of this process. So broadly speaking, I try to build models of the brain um, to understand how the brain makes sense of the world. And then it closely interplays with artificial intelligence systems where if you better understand the brain, you might be able to build better artificial intelligence systems and vice versa, tools that are being used these days for artificial intelligence can be used um, to understand the brain. So there's some interplay between these two areas. And this is really a very interdisciplinary field that spans a lot of different um, areas from the sciences that are mathematical and computer science up to cognitive science and psychology and neuroscience. And I've emphasized here mathematics and the research I do and kind of this field as a whole, mathematics has a, a large influence. So I wanted to ask, a, to start with a question, who has better vision? Um, so my focus is understanding the visual system and who has better vision, your typical robot or a kid? Um, if anybody, if I can hear you, maybe you can like shout kid or robot. Kid. Okay, so there's some, I guess there's some votes for the kid and some for the robot. Um, if I ask this, even just probably seven years ago or, or so, um, people would obviously say the kid. Um, and I still think it's the kid, um, <laughs> but the robot and the artificial systems have really advanced um, dramatically in recent years, which is why I think we got some votes for the, for the robot. And so from my perspective, again, it's kind of this interplay. So if we understand how the brain solves vision, this can help us build artificial, better artificial systems and vice versa, um, current models of artificial systems um, have interestingly been useful for studying the brain. So I'm interested in how the brain makes sense of visual information. So when you see this image and I'm sure all of you have you know, walked around campus and seen the lake. So you infer all kinds of things about the image that it's a sunny day and that it's on campus and there's a bird and reflections and so on. And so um, I'm interested in this complex process of how the brain makes sense of the visual world. And vision is interesting. It's an, it's an intriguing aspect. It's not just we take a photo snapshot camera. Um, there's a lot of things that go into how we make sense of the visual world. So we all know kind of where is Waldo or finding somebody in a crowd. We can also make sense of images that are appear distorted or outlined where the texture is gone and so on. Um, so we can 
still recognize these images quite well. And when we look at images, we look at particular parts of the image. So we don't, um, we don't just, well, we could, if we looked long enough, we might look everywhere, but there's definitely parts of the image that are more salient that we tend to focus our attention on. And so we tend to look at things that are more salient and stand out. I've also been intrigued as well as in my research by visual illusions. So even though visual illusions might seem an anomaly of the system, it's actually a window into how we make sense of the visual world. So this tells us something about our perception. And when you look at this illusion, these two green pieces should look different. And I assume that they do on the screen. Can, I, can everybody see the illusion? Yeah, so the two greens should look different, but actually they're the same. And here's another illusion where this center orientation, although the center orientation is exactly the same, it appears different due to the surrounding stimuli. So spatial context or what surrounds a given point in space that you look at affects how you perceive um, stuff in the world. So it, it can lead to illusions. It can affect what's salient and what you focus on like here um, and plays a major role in vision. So in terms of visual processing, um, the brain or neurons in the brain give rise to how we perceive the world. And so in neuroscience, people do experiments um, from parts of the brain. This is um, an early area of visual processing known as uh, primary visual cortex. Um, and neuroscientists can listen to recordings of neurons. And what Hubel and Weasel won the Nobel Prize for is discovering that neurons in this primary visual cortex are selective for oriented structure. So what I'm showing you here is an image and you can think of it like um, filters that you all um, use in Instagram and in Photoshop and in different cases you, you use filters to filter the image. Um, what the early visual cortex does is it for a very tiny piece of the visual field, um, it cares about orientation structure. So one neuron can care about vertical stuff in the image and another neuron might care about horizontal stuff in the image. And this shows an image filtered with vertical orientation. And you can see that there's um, the vertical stuff is more pronounced in the filtering. So the early parts of visual processing focus on kind of a tiny part of the visual field and on orientation structure is, is kind of considered to be its language. And the idea is that things build up until you, you, you see a more complicated scene. And so spatial context again plays a major role also in neural processing. So if you go beyond a textbook description of what early visual neurons do, you can see that visual neurons are affected by what spatially surrounds a given part of the image, just like in the tilt illusion. So if you have a neuron that responds to a small part of the visual field, so if you put um, a stimulus in a small part of the visual field, it'll respond very strongly. This is um, representing kind of electrical activity. So this shows a lot of a, a strong response, um, a lot of um, spikes. Um, because the neuron is selective to this orientation, if you put something up that covers a larger area beyond what it's receptive to, um, then it can actually suppress the response to the center stimulus. So what happens with neurons is that there's an area in the surround that by itself might not do very much, but if it's placed together with a center, it significantly reduces the response. So one of the things that we've been interested in is understanding for 
for real images, for not what we call natural images, um, how neurons will respond. So when you put a big natural image, a, a big image, and an early part of the visual system um, is receptive to this image, um, how does the surround influence the response to the center? And in addition, what I told you about so far is this first part um, of the visual cortex. And to really make sense of a complex image, you need to think about what happens in later parts of the visual system. And so the way the visual system is built, you have these different processing areas where you start to, to go from this very simple orientation to more complex structure. And so what we've been interested in is understanding how the neurons in the brain make sense of structure um, when you have uh, something in a center region and contextual surround information and how um, this goes from very simple kind of early visual areas to later visual areas. So the motivation for, for this talk and for kind of my interest in this field and, and research is um, spatial context is very prominent both in neurons and perception. It's critical to how we see. So it's important for grouping stuff. It's important for segmentation and everyday behavior and deficits in contextual effects. So things like, you know, we see these illusions, we see this salience, um, the surround affects how we perceive the center and deficits have been implicated um, in disorders and, and sometimes when in, in aging, you, know, you, you lose some of the um, contextual influences and understanding spatial context effects in the brains um, can also help build better artificial systems. So kind of the obstacles that have driven a lot of my research is that when I started in this area and you know, today we've advanced a lot, understanding how the brain responds to image to complex images um, was really poorly understood and today it's gotten better. And so I'm gonna tell you about contextual effects with, with complex images. And then the other obstacle, which again has really um, improved in recent years is the idea that we don't, we didn't understand much of what goes on in higher visual areas. And I think you know, we're making a lot of progress um, for, for these, both these areas. And what's helped make progress is computation and math in addition to, of course, um, neuroscience and psychology and so on. So I'm gonna talk to you about two types of modeling and math related ideas that I've worked on and they're quite different. So, but they still relate together to these contextual effects. So, and there, you'll see that there's also a common thread. So the first idea will be, I wanna build a computational model of contextual effects for visual neurons. And I'm gonna focus on these neurons that are selective for orientation. So they kind of pick out oriented structure in the world. And I'm gonna start with that. And what you'll see is that in this model, I build it up kind of in a, what I would say, or what people in the field would say is a principled way. It's a model where you kind of understand all the components, you put in probability and you, um, can really understand what's going on. And then the second part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about recent advances in machine learning and deep learning where people are building these very large scale models that will start to pertain not just to the early visual cortex, but to get to higher visual areas. And there the system is much bigger. It might be harder to understand. Just like with the brain, it's harder to understand what's going on. Um, so it's a much larger scale model trained on lots and lots of images, um, but it gives kind of insights to what's going on and, and to getting richer representations. So I'm gonna start with um, 
I'm going to start with some data. So, so this is data that was um, collected by a collaborator of mine who, who does neuroscience um, experiments. And I'm not going to show you a lot of data graphs because I'm trying to make this um, kind of more general, but I, I wanted to show you this one because this is what motivated um, part of our interest in images and understanding how cortex responds to images. And it'll also show you how it relates to the modeling. So um, if you put up a small image, um, this is about um, a, the size that it, it's fixed to the size that a, a neuron in early visual cortex will be selective for. And this one above is a large image. So it gives you the spatial context. And what we found is that when you, this is one neuron and a bunch of images, and you put up these images and sometimes you get suppression and sometimes you get facilitation. What is that, or not, not much response at all. What does that mean? If the response is suppressed, it's like the neuron doesn't like the image very much. It's, it's lowering its response. Um, so that's why I put the thumbs down. If it um, stays the same, um, then it, it, it it still um, is going to respond. It's like it's still responding strongly to the image, just like it did um, to the center's part. So what we found is that when you put up different images, you get different strengths of suppression, and we wanted to understand why that's the case. Like, how can you, if you show a neuron an image, how do you know how a neuron will respond to the image? And we started out with what I call like a vanilla yogurt model, which is a very simple model that people use in the field. And the model says something like this, that if you are a neuron in a certain part of visual space, then there's other neurons in other parts of visual space. And when everybody's seeing the same thing, when they're all responding strongly, then it you suppress your response. So it's a kind of a, it's known as a normalization model where when a lot of neurons are active, then maybe it, there's not that much interest. You're gonna just lower your response. Um, and it's formulated mathematically as a divisive model. Um, and we tried fitting this model to the data and we basically got a poor fit. So what we found is that when you had suppression for images, then the response of the standard model was fine. But even when images weren't suppressed, the standard model often thought that you should get um, surround suppression. So basically this model, a lot of the time when you had a large image predicted that the response of the neuron would be um, muted down even though it wasn't. And so this is a um, computational framework, which is understanding statistical regularities in images. And the idea is that images are not just um, like white noise, they have certain regularities. And an appealing thought is the brain might be sensitive to these regularities. And that's an idea that's been around um, for a long time and, um, and we kind of took it to this, to this problem. So if you look at um, an image and you have two neurons that are spatially nearby, then you can filter the image from both neurons perspective. And what you find is that there's a lot of regularity. So when one neuron responds strongly, like around Einstein's, um, tie area, then the other neuron will also be likely to respond strongly. And this can be seen as statistical dependencies. So um, knowing something about the response of one neuron can tell you about the response of another neuron. And this can be form formalized. And this is kind of an empirical plot of the distributions. And I thought I would show it to you because it's a simple, um, probabilistic concept of, of statistical dependency. So I just wanna give you the main idea. Um, we have on one axis, the response of one um, oriented neuron in one location and another axis, the response of the other one. And what this shows is that when the response of one neuron is low, then the response of the other neuron has a distribution in the model. 
And when the response is, of one is high, then the response of the second has a distribution. And if they were statistically independent, then these should be the same, but they're not. So this is kind of following just a, a simple um, idea about what statistical independence mean. And you could see empirically that when you look at these regularities of filters that are nearby in space and orientation, then what they see in the image is not statistically independent. Um, said another way, nearby pieces of the image have a lot of regularities. So if you can, you know, just like you see over here, if you know the structure of surrounding areas, that tells you a lot about something in a center area. But here we're studying it from the point of view of this early cortex and orientation structure. And so this, as I was saying, this dates back. So this is a picture of Barlow and Atnev and Barlow in the 1950s were influenced by information theory. And what they posited is that um, maybe one of the things that's important when you have visual information is to reduce things that are really predictable and redundant and not that interesting. And then um, I'm now interpreting it a little further. You could link that to the idea that if you reduce redundant stuff that are um, the same everywhere, then you, this might highlight what's salient. And so we kind of followed this idea and said, if we have something that's dependent, then let's make it statistically independent. And in this case, we, um, we could come up with a model that can generate the dependencies. So this is a, a common approach in uh, machine learning and probabilistic models where you could either aim to make things more independent or you could come up with a model of the dependencies and then you can invert the model and make it more independent in this case. So, here, it turns out that to generate the kind of dependencies that you typically see across space and images, you could take two things that are independent. And it turns out that if you create a dependency, it just so turns out that it's multiplicative, then you get exactly this form of dependency. And if you can generate dependencies, then you can undo the dependencies and get the independent pieces. Um, using another kind of popular approach of, uh, of inference. And so what we did was we built this model where we could generate what dependencies you typically have in images. And then we said a goal might be to reduce these dependencies. Um, so it kind of puts a goal on your model. And Intuitively, when you think of these dependencies across space, you know, maybe the simplest thing that makes sense is something like contrast. So you have contrast that's similar across different spatial regions, and you can generate dependencies of contrast in different across locations. Um, but it extends beyond our contrast. So now that we had this kind of, have this probability in our hands, we can take our vanilla yogurt and add the toppings, so the chocolate and the strawberries, and get a richer model of what's going on or, or how we want to model the system. And, and why is this richer? Um, because once we can generate dependencies, I'll show you in a moment, we can build something that looks richer about images. Um, I want to point out that this model um, has this, it turns out it, it relates to this, what I call the standard model, which has a divisive suppression. This model results in, in divisive suppression because you generate the dependencies multiplicatively and you undo it by dividing. Um, why, is the, why is it richer than what I told you? Because if you actually look at an image, then it turns out Things that are dependent usually are things that are inside um, an object and have similar texture. So um, this is a cartoon, but what you see is that within this zebra image, you have these strong dependencies um, across locations. So knowing surrounding regions tells you a lot about the center. 
But if you look across the borders, then actually you have a lot more independence because you have the zebra versus its surrounding. And so, um, so in that case, you start off with things that are more independent between the center and surround. So we built a model that basically learns um, structure, dependency structure in a bunch of images and predicts for every patch, what is the probability that this model is true, um, like inside the zebra? And what is the probability that this model is true? And then based on which one is the correct one or the degree of the correctness, um, it can reduce the dependencies. And so I just want to remind you, there is math everywhere in this type of approach um, because we're making a probabilistic model and we're estimating something from the model. And this, I'm not going to go through the equations, but just to say that there's a relation to you know, which of these models are correct for a given patch. And so you learn on a lot, a lot of images and then you can estimate for a given image that you're seeing. So what this type of modeling approach does is it goes beyond the standard model by suggesting that the statistics or probabilities in natural images can tell you when you should have division by surrounding neurons and when you shouldn't. And the idea is that when things when the structure is very similar in center and surround, then you want to reduce the responses. It, it, again, you could think of it as there's not much interest, like the surround is telling me already everything I know about the center, they're, they're the same. But when the surround is different from the center, then you don't want to re reduce the responses. So this relates to ideas about salience, that, about um, salient visual structure. And when you run this model, it's not perfect, but you get a much better fit to the neural data. So now um, the model could much better predict when you don't have much suppression. And like the standard model, it can also predict when you do have um, suppression. And so, so this is um, this idea of using structure in natural, in images, um, can really improve understanding of, of how the system is working. And for this work, we, we actually started looking at simple stimuli. So if you have simple combinations of center and surround stimuli, how should these neurons respond? When should you get surround suppression? Um, where basically homogeneity, but also the geometry of the arrangement determines how much suppression you have. And then we went to complex images, which um, were more of a mystery when, you know, can we predict for more complex images when we should get suppression and when not? And intriguing things like the tilt illusion, where whether you, or the amount of the tilt illusion can depend on how you're grouping or segmenting the center or the, and the surround. So that, that kind of wraps up kind of this, this part of the talk, the first type of model I told you about, um, which we're modeling one visual area. It's a kind of principled statistical modeling approach. And I've been really interested in going beyond these um, early areas that are selective orientation and understanding what's going on over here for higher visual areas. And these are cartoons from um, showing, for example, that the second cortical visual area starts to care about things like textures, um, line combinations. Um, it starts to build up more complex structure it also sees a, a, a larger, maybe two times as larger spatial region um, each neuron sees as the early areas. And then when you get to, to areas um, that are considered object recognition areas, um, you start finding selectivity to, um, to objects, to more complex structure. So there's this buildup in the brain from simple features to more complex uh, feature representations. 
And then the question for me, for somebody working on modeling and computation is how do you go and, and model these richer effects? And that's where some of the recent advances in machine learning and deep learning come into play. So deep learning and has been, is an approach um, for learning structure. Um, and it was popularized for um, in computer vision for object recognition and, and the idea, but today it's used for tons of fields for biology, for medicine, for physics, for um, from any many, many fields where you have large scale data that you want to make sense of. It. And the way it works here is you want to recognize this dog. And if you just do it with one step of processing, like this early visual cortex I told you, that's not enough. The way this system works is you have multiple stages of processing. Here you might have features that are, like I told you, in the first area of, of visual processing that are oriented. Um, but then the outputs of this first stage of processing go to a next stage of processing that sees more of the visual field. Um, so it's kind of coarser in its representation and starts to, um, this is real visualizations from a deep network. It starts to, um, to have more texture structure. And as you go on to higher areas you, of the deep network, you start to have more complex structure, more like object-like. And um, the idea is that by um, tiling lots and lots of layers, not just three, this is just for a cartoon, you can, and learning on lots and lots of images. So this is like a labeled learning idea, supervised learning in this case of what I'm showing you, you see many, many, many dogs and other um, images. And then when you're shown a new dog, then you can tell it's a dog. And so you have in each stage, you have a set of computations. And one way to think about deep neural networks um, that I like is this idea of um, untangling. So if you're just in early layers and you want to tell apart, you know, Sam from Joe, you might not do a very good job because if you look at the plane of responses of these artificial neurons to these two individuals, you won't really have a good way to separate them or it won't be obvious. But if you go and process many layers, then you can get a good separation between these two individuals. So this is not a new idea. Um, machine learning, um, neural networks and deep learning approaches have been around you know, since, since the, the 1950s or so. Um, but, but what is new? So, so what is new is one, we have you know, huge large scale data sets. Two, we have more processing power, um, GPUs that allow us to run learning on much, much larger databases. And three, what people in the field, but I think it's really because of one and two are clever tricks or ways to make the learning work well. Um, and what you can see here, so this is, these are two images of a well-known database known as ImageNet where, um, you could see the top five. So this is a deep neural network trained on these images and it notes you know, for, each, um, for each of its top five picks, what percent it thinks it's correct. So for this one, it thinks it's motor scooter, but you know, somewhat of a lower probability for go-kart. This is a leopard, but it might be a jaguar or a cheetah. You see that these things are quite close to each other. Um, and in this database, there's, um, lots and lots of images and there's very specific labels like you see the Egyptian cat and the snow leopard. And what happened is that, you know, the top error rate used to be quite high, but then, um, you know, at some point, um, this is kind of well known, the AlexNet, um, the error started to get lower and you could see that it has, you know, continued to go lower and this is just until 2017. But you could see that for a very specific task, like learning this recognition, um, the robot is actually, the robot is just a cartoon for the artificial, you know, for the deep neural network. 
but you can see the deep neural network is, is beating the human um, for this very specific task. And so um, machines have gotten very good at object recognition, um, as I'm sure you, you're aware of in your everyday life. Um, you know, your phone is recognizing yourself and, and, and other things if you like it to and so on. Um, they've gotten very impressive. So this is um, back in 2016 after research by uh, Gati Sadal. Um, you could see an image and you can make it in a, a certain art style. Um, you could also see the first image I showed in the talk where there's these artificial systems that are creating um, quite impressive looking images. Um, these are again, not real faces, but they're generated by learning lots and lots of faces. Um, so, so, so these artificial systems have definitely gone, gotten very strong. Um, my interest in, in these systems has been, again, going back to the relation between deep networks and the brain. And deep networks are only very loosely matched to, to, the, biolo to the biology structure. But very interestingly, it's been shown that they're a good tool to actually make progress on understanding neurons in these higher visual areas going beyond this primary visual cortex. And this is just a cartoon showing you in the brain, you have this progression to the different areas. And in a deep network, you also have a complex understanding of an image is made up of lots of layers where you have these linear and nonlinear computations going on in both. Um, they're not the same. The very basic deep network just goes from one layer to the next. Um, more sophisticated ones, and particularly our brain, um, have recurrent connections. A layer feeds onto itself. There's feedback going on from one layer to the other and so on. So it's gotten very sophisticated. Um, the brain is very sophisticated uh, compared to the deep neural network. Um, but deep neural networks have gotten, um, they're, there's, they're coming out all the time and, and every day. Um, what I want to do is look at the very basic deep neural networks and compare them to, um, to, to neurons or to, to what contextual means in these networks. So kind of from my perspective, I wanted to understand higher visual areas. And I also focused on this context effects, which are not well understood um, in, neural, in deep neural networks. And there's been some, some related work these days. You know, do deep neural networks have illusions like we do? Um, are they fooled in the way we are? Um, do they recognize things in the world in the way we do? And we focused on contextual effects. And what we wanted to do is understand how neurons in these areas, what um, contextual might look like in a deep network um, aspect. So what I'm plotting here, and this is work in progress, is we have a deep neural network. We take a neuron, um, like a feature in the deep neural network, we visualize the stimulus that gives the strongest response for the neuron. And then we ask if we hold this fixed, then what is the stimulus that gives the most suppressive response, it kind of um, dampens the response? And what's the stimulus that gives the most facilitative response? And so this is like an optimization based on the gradient in the network where we can visualize these things, which is um, commonly done these days in neural networks. And so what we found, and again, remember, this is a big system. So it's not like my first model where it was much more compact and I can understand all the pieces. Here, it's a little bit more like a brain. We're probing the pieces. We don't, we're not sure we understand that we want to see what's going on. And so what's happening here is that we found that it's quite common in these networks. This is a pretty standard and early uh, deep neural network that the most suppressive surround is similar in structure to the center. So this mimics a bit what I showed you in the earlier model where when the center and surround are similar that dampens the response of this artificial neuron. 
but when the surround is different, it doesn't. And we saw this for a bunch of neurons, especially from the starting from the middle layers. So very early area layers, you might not see that. Um, if you plot the most um, excitatory feature that it likes and you hold that fixed and you see that the most suppressive um, surround is similar to the center, whereas the most um, facilitative surround is different. Um, in some cases, especially in, in high, really high layers, we found that even when you alter the center stimulus to be not what the neuron likes, then the most suppressive surround matches the center. So you could see this in, in these visualizations. So this interestingly showed us that deep neural networks have some of this property of suppressing um, homogeneous or similar structure, but with things that go beyond orientation. So it's more complex structure. And so what we've done is we went back and we looked at a bunch of traditional neuroscience experiments and we simulated them with a network and we tried to ask when does it succeed and when does it fail and we know that for our first model with orientation we can capture most of these phenomena quite well uh, we found that the deep networks um, kind of amazingly ex explains a lot of the data so we, we can capture a lot of contextual effects to do with orientation um, with the deep network but not everything. So example failures are that the attention to geometric structure and when you get suppression and when you don't um, appears to be not consistent as it is in the brain and in um, the, the first model we worked on, for example. Um, I think I'm gonna skip the data, but we this is all based on really looking at graphs and data and, and comparing um, experiments to um, to neural data. Another thing that we, we found interesting is that if you look at these standard deep networks, again, we don't quite understand them like we did the earlier model, but we could still characterize statistical dependencies. And what we find that if you look at nearby neurons in the networks, as you go to higher uh, layers, you start to get more statistical independence. So it, appears as though these neural networks might be doing some of what we have in the earlier model, although it's not asked to do it, right? The model, the deep networks are trained to recognize dogs and cats and so on. Um, they're not trained to reduce statistical dependencies. Um, the other thing we, we got out of it is that we can, if we compare our um, a deep neural network with and without some of the more sophisticated like brain-like um, computations we think happen, then if you add enough layers to a deep neural network, um, they're both competitive, but for small networks with less layers, having more brain-like computations can be an advantage. Um, I wanna point out that there's really interesting work on deep networks and perceptual success and failures. When do they fail yet relative to human? So this is an elephant and this is a cat. Um, what is this? If, if maybe if you could answer. I think I heard cat. So, so a human usually says cat and a deep learning system would usually still be texture biased and think it's an elephant. And so what I take from this is that even though deep networks appear to suppress some of the texture structure, like we, we think in the brain um, and then recognize shapes, um, there is what's known as a texture bias in deep networks. And although there's a texture bias in deep networks, there appears to be partial success recently in closing the gap. So a lot of different deep network systems have been tried. And if you train with enough layers and enough data, you might be able to um, 
to close the gaps of, of human perception in certain ways, but this is still very much an ongoing topic. When do deep networks succeed? When do they fail? Um, and can we understand what's going on? So part of my interest and also some, some others in the field is if you take deep neural networks and you consider a bunch of brain computation things we know happen in the brain and have modeled like my normalization, previous work and, and work of others or maybe recurrent connections. Um, does that give a better match to neural and perceptual data? Um, does that do better for um, artificial, like for computer vision tasks? So this is an ongoing um, topic. So I want to wrap up. Um, I've told you that um, vision in my mind is intriguing and I've focused a lot on context and illusions and salience and all kinds of things that come out of contextual effects. And I've shown you two different ways that we've thought about it in terms of understanding co contextual processing in the brain. One relates to studying statistical irregularities in images. So we're not labeling the image, we're looking at the regularities. The other relates to these advances in deep neural networks and learning on images um, recognition through a lot of layers and trying to understand how those pertain to contextual effects. And I think a promising direction is incorporating more biologically realistic computations into deep neural networks. I think it will essentially allow to maybe do some of the same things with less layers. So a more efficient representation, just like we, I, I think we have in the brain. So, so that, that's it for me. Um, I added acknowledgements of people who, who've worked with me on some of these issues. Um, and um, if you have questions. Maribel? Yeah, come here, it's fair. <laughs> hey, Adelia, thank you very Hi. much for your nice talk. I think everybody wants to go for lunch, maybe that's why. Um, so I, I have heard lately this um, uh, this new subject that they call like twin digital twins, right? And uh, so I was wondering like whether in neural networks that's what we are trying to to do, like to have a digital twin of of the brain. So because we use neural networks to 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 predict or to classify things, and but uh, but my wonder is whether we will be in in a moment where where this deep neural network will be able to sense also because your talk sounds like okay uh when we have the brain and we see something we like or we, we see something with we, we dislike the neurons react right so is it do you think that 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 will be possible like in the near future that our network neural network artificial neural network will be able to do thump, something like this that it reacts to what it likes, what it doesn't like, as as you were stating in your in your slides, because it's it would be really really interesting. Yeah, I I think um, there so so the, on one hand, you know, we can use these neural networks to um, connect them to neural responses and what the neural responses are. Um, we could also use them to understand. You know, what people find as interesting or what they like, what, what looks beautiful. I think probably the, the area um, that's most known for interconnection with, with um, artificial systems is the motor system, right? Where we know that we can put electrodes in the brain and learn um, using something very simple, just the first area of motor processing, you can um, learn the intentions of somebody that cannot move their arm and in turn you could move the arm so you, you need kind of the system where it not only is reading your intention but could also promote action and there's also work um, on uh, visual processes so can you people who have reduced vision can you improve their vision and so 
so yes, I do think that there's you know, promise of these approaches, um, which give you a more um, rich picture of the brain um, of certain tasks to link with artificial systems, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another question? Mm, no. Uh, well, thank you for your nice talk and interesting. And thank you uh, for the audience to be here this morning. Thank you. Have a good lunch. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have lunch outside and we come back.